Um, I've been a public educator for over 25 years, so I have a teacher voice. So if I'm not loud enough, let me know, but if I'm too loud, um, let me know that too. Um, but it is uh, a real pleasure to be with you this morning. I um, appreciate the invite and just glad to be here to talk to you a little bit about the work that we've done in district and school transformation. Um, you have in front of you a copy of the PowerPoint as well as some data, but I would really like to talk to you about the successes and focus on the work we've done to date and then moving forward where we are now. And then from that, I would ha be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I'm very passionate about this work, so if I get passionate and move too quickly, please don't hesitate to stop me and ask questions. Um, this work is near and dear to my heart, so it's a real pleasure to be here to talk to you about it today. Um, I am the Director of District and School Transformation, and just so you know a little bit about my history, um, I've worked in elementary, middle, and high school. I've been an administrator of a low-performing school that turned around, um, and then came to the department when we first started our work in 2007, transitioning into working with uh, 44 high schools that were um, brought to our attention through the court system. So I've worked through much of our uh, transformation ourselves in working with schools and hopefully we'll be able to shed some light on, on some of the questions you've asked this morning. So to highlight just the work of the division, um, I just wanted you to sort of hear some statistics from the data that's in front of you um, as well as from an outside study that was done during the race to the top time period and sort of the findings from that and how that's helped us in terms of moving forward. We're constantly in a continuous improvement model, so we're always wanting to seek information through data and through sources where our efforts have been in place. So we're very proud to say that 100% of the traditional public school high schools that we've worked in through the past five years did improve their graduation rate. And that was a big concern um, five years ago when we started uh, in this work. And um, after four years of our work in schools, we had a significant improvement um, in their scores. And so we just wanted to highlight that of those 118 schools that we serve, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what serve means, um, 83% of them were no longer in the bottom 5%. And then when we looked at the data even further, there were 67% that were no longer in the bottom 10%. So when you are moving a school forward and making improvements, what you're hoping to do is improve the floor or raise the floor. And then you want your schools that you're in to be higher you don't want other schools to fall below yours, but unfortunately, that's what happens in order, there's always gonna be a bottom 5%. Um, our goal would be that the bottom 5% are 99% proficient or 100% proficient. But when you move out of the bottom 5%, it has to happen over time. And so we were um, really glad to see that our schools were moving beyond that bottom 5% and even some of those were um, outside of the bottom 10%. And then lastly, um, during the time period when this data and we were serving these particular schools, we had about 70% who met or um, exceeded growth. And we know that in low performing schools, you have to grow faster because you're behind. So we really focused on knowing where the children were when they came in and helping schools develop systems, processes, and procedures that we're going to move those children quickly to get them to grade level. <coughs> Ultimately, we want that to happen as quick as it can. And so for those schools that exceeded growth, we're talking in terms of making more than a year's worth of growth for a year's worth of education. So that was a real um, pleaser and something that we were really focused on as well as having um, their proficiency. We're going to shift gears now. That's sort of the numbers and um, the information from the data in the end of course and in the grade testing. Now we're going to shift to a study that was actually done by an outside evaluator during this same time period. 
And one of the um, models that we developed during the, these services was a district model. So I want to explain to you sort of a school model and a district model. In the school model, we were serving the school, simply in the school, and I'll tell you what the service looks like. In the district model, we were serving the school and the district. So when we talk about service, we're bringing people in, coaches, that are working alongside of teachers, working alongside of principals, and working alongside of superintendents to help build their capacity and then so that we can lead them to do the great work and move on to provide that service other places. So we had this outside evaluator, Dr. Gary Henry, who evaluated many components of our program. But the one that was in the, fifth, the final year, the report that we just received, really looked at some effects on student performance in our district model. And what we found and what he found and shared with the state board and continues to share with us, and I'll talk to you a little bit about that, is that that district model made a difference. Having that coach who was making the connections between schools and districts did make a difference in improving student achievement. So you can read there that there was a comparison group and then we were in the group that he studied through uh, focus groups as well as looking at data and um, interviewing folks in the school as well as our staff to get an idea of what kinds of programs and work we did in those schools and then looked at the data to see how it impacted. So if you look at it, you see that those schools that we were serving in that district model did have higher scores in both math and science, and they improved more than the schools without those services. So we know that in that coaching and in that building the capacity of those schools and districts, we are helping student achievement. And those are making, those, that's what we want to focus on is making sure we're improving student achievement. So specifically in English and language arts, we did have a literacy focus in our coaching and working. We tried to um, approach everything that we did through its impact on literacy. And you can see there, again, we had positive effects on the reading and scores in elementary and middle. There was also, there was a significant effect in elementary and middle, however, in high school, it was positive, but not statistically significant. But still, we were seeing the positive and moving in the right direction. And then finally, um, we also had proficiency gains, as I mentioned earlier, in math and science in um, our middle schools as well as in elementary. So one of the things, if you understand the construct of our um, service, we provide coaches at the instructional level for science and math and for language arts in the middle and high schools. And at the elementary level, we provide coaching that will address all curriculum areas because you rarely in an elementary school have a, um, a science class. It's more of a fourth grade, third grade. And so we had to look across all of the um, curriculum areas and provide coaching there. In addition to the classroom coaching, we also provide coaching for principals and then we provide coaching for district leadership, superintendents and leadership groups uh, within a central office. Now that was a lot and I'm happy to answer questions, but I'll just keep going to let you know kind of what we've learned. And what I want you to know about sort of this so that you understand, this is um, anecdotal, but from research. So we, wrote down some of the things that are in language that we talk in terms of how can we improve and do better. Um, if we didn't reach 100%, how can we reach 100%? What can we do that we didn't do? And what does the research tell us? And what does the data about our schools tell us? And what are our schools telling us? And this is basically what we've learned. And the first one is that everything we do has to be driven by data. Not because we think it'll work, not because maybe we'll try it, but because it's what we need. It's based on what the needs of the school are. So that customized support 
is what our coaches really focus on in the field. When they're in a school, to say that we have a coaching model or a specific way, we really go in and assess the situation. So that brings up our second point, which was also from uh, pointed out in Dr. Henry's research, is that the Comprehensive Needs Assessment, or CNA, really does go into a school and provide us a snapshot of what's going on. It's a very intense, um, two-day, spent all day talking with everybody we can talk to in those schools to learn what's going on in the school so that we can then help the school figure out where their trigger points are and where we can improve the things that are going on in the school through building their capacity. That then informs school improvement plans. And then if you have a school improvement plan that we like to think of in terms of a process and an ongoing planning system, that it's not something that you just write and then you're finished and you go on about your business. It really does inform what you're doing and it's based on that data. The part I've already talked about is this customized support and that district level coaching as well as school level coaching so that we are really um, making sure that there is a connection between the de decisions that are made at a district level and decisions that are needed or resources that are needed at a school and that everyone is on the same page in terms of what they are. So we really work hard in our district model to make that connection. Um, this is not anything new and everything you read, leadership matters, and it does matter. It matters in the classroom, it matters in the school, and it really matters um, at the district level. And so we just reinforce that because we really focus our work on building those good leaders and building their capacity to lead the school. The other one is the one that um, probably causes the most of us to take a deep breath, and that is that it takes time, and it takes change. And both of those things, we don't have much of time, and nobody likes change. So we're working in, in two domains that are um, difficult, but we know that that's what it takes. It doesn't happen overnight. And then finally, and these are not really in any order, but that the community is critical. So the community being the community within the school, the community of, around the school, around the district, including families, business partners, all of that matters in bringing about change and improvement in elect performance school. So here's what we know um, from the 2014-15 data. When the uh, new low performing law uh, came in, we identified the low performing traditional public schools, charter schools, and in addition, there was a new law um, about low performing districts. And so in that, we have 581 schools. If you combine the 547 and the 34, there's 581 low performing schools in the state, and then 15 districts and you need to know that the definition of a low performing district is basically and I'm not going to quote statute but it is that over 50% of the schools in that district are low performing so um, there are 15 of those across the state so in moving forward with a new direction and um, looking at our department after uh, Race to the Top ended, we developed a new model called North Carolina Transformation, and that's the model that we are putting in place right now. That's based on our history, as well as based on the successes that we had, the lessons that we learned from our previous work. Um, it is also, we are also working again with Dr. Henry, who is looking at this program um, in a continuation study of the work that was done prior. So you may see the NCT model in, in the future because um, it's a partnership that we are working through Dr. Henry and some other um, partnering agencies. 
But just so you understand what our model looks like, we took those lessons learned and we developed it basically into a four-part um, way of explaining. And pictures usually help to explain a model. So first of all, at the top, you'll see that data, and data is, I can't stress enough how important data is, and that helping people understand that all are data. And I catch myself saying data is, but it's really data are, because everything that happens in that school is data. Not just what you have in front of you, but what we see when we're there and experiencing life in that school every day. So everything we take into account when we're trying to improve the school or work with the school. The comprehensive needs assessment is critical because it does help us sort of focus in and help the school focus in and identify the areas that they may need some support in. When you do a self-evaluation, sometimes you look at yourself a lot differently. And um, when someone else comes in, they can help you see another side to the things that are going on in your school. In addition, we're adding a, um, an unpacking so that you understand from the comprehensive needs assessment we develop a detailed report about the school. And from that report, if it's left in the school, then you're kind of leaving it up to the school to know what to do with it next. So we learned through our experiences that we need to go in and unpack that report so that it informs the school improvement planning process. And so we teach that through a process that can then be applied in other situations for school improvement planning. A golden opportunity for us to expand the comprehensive needs assessment that we know work in the, the previous work that we've done. Then we talk about what are the best practices for school improvement and how do they apply? How do we customize those to the situation in the school that we're in? When you're in a, a school in Durham and you're in a school in Hertford County or you're in a school anywhere across the state, you're in a unique place. They're, they are blessings for people in that neighborhood, in that community, and we need to understand what their challenges are, what their successes are, and what their culture is. So, and then help them understand what we need to do to get them to a place where all of their children are successful and all of the schools. So our ultimate goal is to have no low-performing school. When we bring on staff members, during our previous grant, we said, your job is to work yourself out of a job. And that's the way we want you to think, is to work yourself out of a job so there aren't any low performing skills. And then lastly, the customized coaching and professional development that we work with in the schools is that work that is boots on the ground, every day, side by side, blood, sweat, and tears with all the schools that we're working in to improve them. And then the professional development helps sort of tie it together with state initiatives, best practices, and the research so that we can build the capacity of the folks working in the schools and therefore the improvement would sustain. The other piece in uh, this whole triangle, and we call it more of a family because it's a, it's a circuit that we're working in, it's constantly moving. And there are other factors that always come into schools that influence them positively and negatively. So our presence there, our knowledge of what's going on, and our familiarity with the people and relationships is essential because we also want to connect them with other resources. So we want to work with other agencies that are working in the school and try to help them recognize and realize what those opportunities are if they don't know. And so that you know what we're doing moving forward um, with our current staff, we are doing a proportional service delivery model, which is basically 40 elementary schools, 27 middle schools, and 12 high schools. Now, you can do the math. Um, there's 581 schools, and we're serving 79. Um, and we're serving 79 of the lowest in those three categories. So there are a large number of schools that are um, not receiving our services. But of the 79 that are, we are also providing that district coach to the 15 districts. So we have previous um, superintendents, folks who have a great deal of experience at the central office level working with those 15 districts. 
but not one per district. We don't have that many staff, but we are a presence um, in those facilities. So that's our work, um, and I am happy to answer any questions that you may have moving forward. And ultimately, we want to coach them and to improve the school. Um, we do not evaluate, to answer your first question, so we do not evaluate principals. However, we build relationships with principals and help principals see for themselves if this is the right place for them. Um, and we do work collaboratively uh, with the central office to make sure that the supports are in place for those principals if they are particularly new principals because you do find a lot of new principals in uh, some of your lower performance. Let me just have a follow up on that. Follow up. <coughs> Because our model is a coaching model, um, based on history and a previous model that we used, what we learned, and this was back before my time, but what we learned from that experience was when you go in and have the um, heavy stick and you are there to evaluate and remove, things improve. When you leave, they go back to where they were. And that's what we learned through that model. And so our approach was now a coaching model to try and build the capacity of the coach that is in the school and customize that coaching. Does that mean that every coach, I mean, every principal is successful at the end of our tenure there? Absolutely not. Um, and we do have tough conversations that are about is this the right? setting is this the right calling is this the job for you and we have those tough conversations as a coach and we don't have to then cross over into a formal evaluation leading to due process and all of the processes that that entails but everything that we do is public so if there are works and supports that that principal needs we're there to help provide those supports before a superintendent or school system would make the final decision for that. Just the last follow up, um, follow -up. segue to another issue. I, I mean, I understand what you're saying. Um, uh, some people just may not be coachable. And we're talking about children. And, um, you know, I, I think that's, as someone who's worked on one of these teams, and this is what I've done in working at schools that are not on this list, that are probably a part of that group, and going to what you said, Well, 
lot of us share in these beliefs. Um, but when you're looking at what we know, and I agree with everything you have listed here, but there are a few things that are left off that I just wondered are happening in other areas. I mean, looking at teacher quality is, is absolutely critical. And um, there's no mention of poverty. And I'm not saying for this handler, because I absolutely do not believe that. Um, I would go against that. But there is a component, I mean, it's a real issue, it has to be discussed. If you don't discuss it, how are you going to have those long-term changes? So, and you mentioned community involvement, but I would say community culture and understanding the culture of the community. So those three things are in what we know. Is that, am I just wrong, or are they just in other areas? No, you're not wrong. Um, that's not an inclusive list. Um, it's really what we've learned from our previous work, but let me say that we do focus on everything you just mentioned and believe. The culture is what makes it, and yes, there are a lot of factors in poverty schools, in rural schools, in school districts that don't have the resources. There's all kinds of dynamics, but our customized approach is exactly what you just defined as we go and identify all of those things and then apply our work to those very things. So in our way of thinking, customized addresses everything you just articulated. Representative Parks. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Doctor, for the presentation. Uh, could you remind me how long has this model been in place and do you know how much money the state has spent on transformation? I do not know a total figure of how much money um, this has spent. Um, I can certainly get that figure for you. Um, we have been in this particular model since 2007, um, beginning with high schools, and it was known at that time as North Carolina Turnaround. We worked with high schools and middle schools and then a cohort of 20 elementary schools. And then we brought in the district model in three districts that were partners and basically volunteered to partner with us in this work. And then we worked in the bottom 5% of schools in Race to the Top. And that was bottom 5% of the elementary level, bottom 5% of middle, and bottom 5% of high schools. And that was 118 schools. And then the bottom 10% basically of districts during the race to the top period, which was basically from 2010 to 2014, 15, but 14, 15 was an unfunded year by race to the top. So we were there fully staffed for four years and an additional year partial transition. Representative Hanks. It was all the same to the chair. I'll, I'll defer to Representative Moore and just One is, is, you made it clear, and I think it's been clear, it's all about leadership. But then you said that, that you had, in the old model, which was more uh, disciplinary, if you want to call it that, evaluate and maybe remove, uh, that when you use that model, what you found is that everything went fine until you left, and then it went right back to where it was, which would indicate to me that the leadership will fail. And therefore, the leadership needs to be replaced. I mean, that just seems logical to me, not. So, given the fact that, that you've stated, and, and I guess everyone else has said it's all about leadership, but the visits that I've had to local county schools and turnaround schools and to New Orleans and all that, it is all about leadership. So, if it goes, if, it, if you have that little blip and then it goes back, then there's a failure in leadership. Getting off that, uh, well, I do have a question. 118, you said there are 118 high schools, 118 total schools. During Race to the Top, there were 118 total schools. That's correct. That were in the school model. Yes, sir. But there are 547 total schools. I, may, I obviously don't understand. I'm just asking for clarity. Sure, let me explain. Um, in the 118 schools for the race to the top time period, 
the metric of bottom 5% was determined, it was utilized to determine where our services would be deployed. So that's what identified the 118 schools. When the new law for low performing schools and the new definition for low performing schools and low performing districts was released, that generated the 581 schools that are currently, under this current law, low performing. And 500, that's where the 2014-15 slide that you're looking at comes from. So it's two different groups of schools, although there are duplicates. 118 is the, under the old rule, 547 is the new rule. 581, yes. Okay. Representative Warren, I think based on the metric, Dr. Barber said, well, the first look was just bottom 5% period. This new low performing definition appears to me to encapsulate at least roughly five times that number ended up meeting that, so I'm assuming that's roughly 25 or so percent <laughs> of schools may fall within that, the new low performing definition. Um, it's multifaceted, multi-tiered. Um, we work hand in hand, literally, in a coaching model that works side by side with the principal, building that principal's capacity. And we also provide professional development that is through a, a partnership with the university and trying to build leaders that will be able to come and take low performing schools and help improve them. We also provide customized professional development and connect resources with the principals that we have and know of to help build their skills. But basically, it truly is like a doctor prescribes for a patient. It's based on the individual needs of that particular principal. Now, that being said, there are a lot of commonalities one of which is being a brand new principal and you don't know what you don't know so we do try to do some globally effective school improvement training to help them learn what they may not know and build their capacity that way same approach with the central office leadership in terms of building that sense of leadership whether it be the superintendent or the team the central office staff and then making the connections between the two but we really are focused on building capacity of the staff that is in place and helping them to improve their school and build the culture that is there for of high expectations that every student will learn can learn and be successful Representative Verdell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Barber, thank you for a great presentation. You have your work cut out for you. Absolutely. Uh, my congratulations for the schools that you have been successful in. It's a very challenging environment that you can lead to. A few questions I made, Mr. Chairman. Uh, 581 schools are on your radar screen right now, but you're only able to get to 79 with the kind of intensive uh, program that you described to us. What kind of time frames? Talk about time to change. Are we looking at getting to the other schools that are not currently getting the attention? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I can't hear what Representative Vidal is saying. If I can ask him to speak a little louder. Sure, I, th I think I'll, uh, uh, Representative Vidal, go ahead one more time with your teacher, loudest teacher voice. Professor Blackwell. Professor Blackwell. Um, my question, Hugh, was uh, there's 581 schools on the radar of this program, but only 79 are getting the kind of intensive attention that uh, they need. What's the time frame for maybe getting around to the others? And then I'll have some follow-up questions also. And I think you're asking the question that keeps me up at night. <laughs> um, we do have a statewide system of support 
which is a regionally um, support system of cross division representatives who have their fingers on the pulse of those schools that are not receiving the intense services. Um, so we are trying to work within the resources that we have available to deploy resources through that support team regionally. Um, in terms of our plans moving forward, one of the challenges is the annual identification of low performance. So um, when we know it takes time to change and improve schools and we're under an annual re-identification, it creates more challenges as well for the schools too. So um, we're working with them, offering through that service support team model, the resources that we have available. And I have full confidence that when we improve the 79 that we're working in, we'll take another batch. And what we're experiencing in the field right now is, can you just give us more? Um, we, we have a relationship with many of the superintendents and principals of schools across the state, um, both those that have improved and those that are continuing to want to improve. And so we definitely want to serve those. And if I have my wish and a magic wand, um, I would request that we have the staff to serve all 581 and would be happy to deploy those resources that we have. Uh, Literally, as soon as we possibly can, we're, our, we're uh, committed to the 79 that we're working with for 18 months was our commitment to them. Um, but we're also deploying the resources that we have through the other divisions to those other schools. Oh. Oh. Um, <coughs> 15 administrative units that are considered local for me. Mm -hmm. Approximately how many of the 581 schools fall under that uh, 15 districts? That's a great question. Um, it's about half. I can't give you exact numbers, um, but it's about <coughs> half. And a large majority, probably over 60% of the schools that we're serving are also part of that district when you work from the bottom up. Um, and that's how we uh, selected where we could put our resources okay. or in last, those districts. Thank you. One last follow-up. Um, the schools that uh, 581, do they have any cluster? specific areas are they spread out across the state? Like, can we get a map that just kind of shows the districts? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, there are clusters. Um, if you basically look at the northeast and north central regions of the state, um, and then the southeast and Sand Hills area, we have um, quite a few numbers there. Piedmont Triad also has um, a large number of low performing schools. Now these are not where our schools are necessarily. I'm talking about the 581. That was your question. Right. Um, we have very few in the far west. Um, and in fact, I think west of Charlotte, we have one. And I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe it is an alternative type program. And um, so the majority of our, um, the 581 would be from the Piedmont Triad East. Thank you very much. Uh, Representative Haynes. Yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman and Dr. Barber. Thank you for the work that you're doing and attempting to do. Uh, we do appreciate it. Uh, when, I, when I hear these definitions of local form of school, I think uh, the Chairman and I have talked about this. Uh, I still think we're missing a huge group of, of schools that would be defined as both performing by any reasonable definition that the public could put on it. Uh, there are two schools within my district, Forsyth County, that are 6 and 11 percent reading proficiency at the end of third grade. Neither one of those schools appear on this list. Okay, and I want to make sure that the audience understood. I didn't say the average age of the kids was 6 or 11. 
says that 94 to 89 percent of these kids can't read, according to this. So we, and those schools, as far as I can see, are not on this list. And so I think one of the first things we have to do as we look at this is we really need to take another look at what a quote unquote low performing school really is. Because there's no point in starting at 100 or so odds. We got a few years ago, now we're five, you know, 70 or 5 is one, I think you said. And we still know that we're way off in terms of what the real situation is. Uh, and so I, I, one of the questions I'd like to ask you is you said this program has been underway since 2007. Um, and I'd like to know out of those 79, I guess, that we're engaged with, that we're engaged in now, with now, mm -hmm. and really just in that 2007 period to today, how many uh, of those schools were actually turned around? You're asking me to pull numbers together that I don't know I can give you 100% accurate, but I would refer you back to the data from the um, race to the top because we had two different models and the metric changed. So our challenge was how do you show if a school has been turned around when you have different metrics and what is your definition of turnaround? So we look at it in terms of turnaround is, is a reform model but improvement is what we're looking for and so that's the way we tried to track our data in terms of how they're improving. Are they improving the student's proficiency on tests? And are there things in place in schools that are changing that are making positive impacts for kids in other ways that you don't see through a test? So if you were to ask me how many we have had improvement in, um, I would comfortably tell you 100% of the schools we worked in. My definition of improvement and turnaround may not be consistent because turnaround, if you're speaking of moving from not low performing to low performing, or if you're speaking of moving from the bottom 5% out, then we had an 83% success rate that 83% of our schools moved out of the bottom 5% over the race to the top time period. Now we have just gotten in the schools that we're working in from the 581 that were recently identified. Um, and so I can't give you any numbers there, but we've deployed our work, our services there. Okay, follow up please. Uh, and, so you, and so you have to understand, you know, to a guy like me from a, from a heavy education background, okay, both parents, public school teachers, and so on and so forth, um, who represents a district, the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor, okay? You have to understand why, to a guy like me, I listen and, and think about my constituents back home and what they would say about what they just heard from you. You know, there it, it, it sounds it sounds like a lot of talk. It, it, it sounds like we don't want to dig in to where the real issues might very well be because if we're talking about improvement. And you say, well, we had 83% of the schools improve, and you're telling me that my elementary school that I use as an example improved from 6% to 12 or 13% reading position. <coughs> See, for a guy like me and representing communities that I represent, both rich and poor, that still sounds like criminality to me. Okay, when we talk about putting these kids in position where they're not able to read and therefore not able to go on to life to achieve. Let me ask you one quick question, not follow up, sir, please. Uh, of these 581 schools, uh, what is the economic breakdown of those schools? Where do those schools rank economically? Please. They are pretty much widespread. Um, the earlier question about clusters, um, we do have schools that are in um, urban areas. We have schools that are in rural areas. We have schools that are in high poverty areas. We do have large numbers in many of our schools of um, free and reduced lunch. Yes, so, so, so to interrupt, and not, well, I, I thought I was not to interrupt, I, I intended to interrupt, I'm sorry. But I need, to, <laughs> I need to, to pause there. But we could agree that the vast majority of these kids, and, and you're a PhD in education, so, and, and many of the folks here are school and education. So I think 
you know, we can talk about this very frankly. The vast majority of these schools that are quote unquote not reforming are poor schools, mostly free and reduced lunch, and a large number of them high minority student populations. Would that be fair? Yes. Okay. That would be fair. So, so I guess when we start talking about education and we start talking about this in terms of the broader culture of our United States and the broader culture of the South in general and the things that we deal with and, the, and kind of the cloud that we live under with regard to opportunity and fairness and fair play and these types of things, you have to understand that for a guy like me, when I hear such things as, you know, this all takes time and change, then the question that automatically comes to me, how much time? How, what, what are we talking about here? Because I'm going home this afternoon and I have two schools that are on this list, five schools that are, and of those five schools that are, 85% or so of those kids are failing that end of the grade third year test. We put them in a summer program in Winston-Salem, and only seven or eight of them pass after the summer program. And so my question to you really does come down to how many of the folks in your organization have succeeded in working themselves out of a job so that I don't have to go back to the poorest student populations in the state and tell them it just takes time. You gotta understand that in my community, that whole thing about go slow and it just takes time, and that doesn't resonate. And I, and, I, and I understand that this, this, this piece is, uh, it's complicated, it starts at the school level, it starts at the family level, it starts at home, it starts at the offices. But I tell you what, what it really does seem to me, and this is through Democratic governors, through Republican governors, through Democratic houses and senates, and Republican senates, houses and senates, it sounds to me that what it really does come down to is that we don't care a whole lot about poor people. Okay? And we're not doing the things that we need to do today from an education standpoint to call it like it is and to deal with it. And, we, and I understand that number, 79 to 581, you said if I got the resources you know, tomorrow, I'd put them out there. And I, I believe that you would. I'm sorry. I believe that you would, all right? But it's so much deeper than that. Are we gonna allow local school systems to create neighborhood schools that everybody who works in education and understands ed policy understand what data are, okay, knows that nine times out of ten, that's a death trap for minority kids in the Southeast United States of America. And at this level here, we're not doing a lot to stop that because we're deferring to what people want to do locally, even though we know we're creating 85% non-reading proficiency schools. So I'm done. That's my that's my spiel for today. You want me to respond? Yes, you like. You might be both another. <laughs> I'm happy. We have two questions left. We need to finish in about three minutes so we can move on to the next thing. And what I would love for you guys to do, just as we don't get to your question, please feel free to email if We can follow up with Dr. Barber and we can get some more specifics. Um, I have uh, Representative Jones, Representative Blackwell, and Sergeant Representative Jones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I will be brief. I know we're low on time and uh, just. Uh, follow up I guess on some of the questions. Could, could you just speak briefly as you go in and you're working with the schools and your bill needs to be done? What's the role of the parents in that? And what's what's the role of the teachers in the school maybe in helping to um, well let's be honest, a lot of times the teachers in the school they know where who are the best teachers, who are not. Um, we know teachers that have children in the system oftentimes uh, they want for their kids to have certain teachers and they don't and so forth. So there, there are certain things that the people that, that live there and work there uh, are, are certainly going to know that somebody coming in can't know as well. So I guess getting back, what is the role A of the parents? What is the role B of, of the teachers as we're going through the process? That's a great question. Um, when we go in, um, initially we do have to sort of establish who we are and what we're there to do. and. Um, one of the first things we do is our comprehensive needs assessment and in that process, which is a two-day um, process for assessment, we talk to parents in focus groups. 
Now, again, you're only going to get a, a small number of parents at that point, but we're also looking at what kinds of parent programs are already in place, how is the community already involved, and trying to do some data searching for the resources that schools have right around them that may, they may miss or that they may be utilizing and how they're utilizing those resources. Um, now, when we're there on a daily or um, where they are serving the school directly, and we don't have coaches that are in a, the same school every day, let me say that. Um, we try to, through the school improvement planning process, talk about through the eyes of the school, how are you utilizing these resources, whether it be the community or parents. And then we're there at parent meetings. We're there at PTA. We're there when they're having a night to talk about the issues within the school, our presence there, and we're also trying to connect people who are close enough to that school that can be there for Saturday events. Many of our coaches go and support students in the schools that they're working in. So we become um, a part of the family and we extend ourselves to families. We also work through some of the other agencies that might be working, whether it be a community in schools um, situation where they have people that they're helping in terms of their goals and we're collaborating with them to try and wrap around family, community, and school. At the same time, focusing on building a culture that is going to address the needs of the students so that they can learn. So. Um, we're basically doing everything that we can possibly do in a school to help them improve. As far as the teachers, um, many of the challenges that uh, were raised earlier, um, when you have teachers in your buildings, in many of the buildings that we work that are in rural communities, um, there's a culture that we need a person that's gonna be here. And, to help schools understand that we've got to get the very best for your students is a culture shift that it's it's okay if you're going to get, hire a new teacher and they're going to leave in three years. If that's the very best you can give to those children for three years, then that's what we want. So building a culture of high expectations and building a culture of not accepting anything less than the best is the work of our coaches with the teachers building a culture that every student can and will learn and that that's not just lip service and not just one way is going to fit everybody and trying to help and build teachers as units to support each other through professional communities that they work in so that the work that we're doing when we're on site coaching can be continued when we leave because it cannot be about us it has to be about the students and it has to be about the work of the people who are in those schools every day working with those students and it's our obligation to build their capacity and improve their skill set and so our instructional coaches work from a model of doing it for you doing it with you and then watching you do it and giving you feedback with that ultimate goal of you being able to do it by yourself when you're gone Does I mean, I, I'm sorry, we're just back. Well, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on because we're going to run out of time before we get to our. Uh, um, please thank Dr. Barber. We really appreciate you coming. Thank and, you. Uh,